Yes, yes. Um, she died the 4th of May last year. Last year. They were just asking about my um, sister Mary Immaculate, who was a blood sister of mine. We had three in our family that are were religious. Um, one is a Franciscan in uh, Pennsylvania, and then Sister Mary Immaculate was a first member of our community, as well as a co-foundress, and she died May 4th of last year. And um, she had a, oh, she was a teacher, she did catechesis, she worked with uh, discernment, uh, just so many, many different things that she did. But she had an incredibly mechanical mind. And she could take anything apart and put it back together. She could tell you how it worked and why it worked and what didn't work. And she could listen to a, a motor in a car and tell you what was wrong with it. This is totally opposite of me. I, am, I can follow directions, but that's it. That's it. But. Um, Sister was ready. She was ready. And it's interesting how our humanity comes into things every day. But she had been praying for the Lord to take her. She knew it was time. I mean, she really knew it was time. And she had been asking our different donees and friends and people that we work with and parishioners or whatever, please pray that God will take me soon. Please pray that God will take me soon. Because it's time. She knew it was time, and she wanted to be ready. Well, she had the sacraments all the time, and confession, and mass, and communion every day, and community prayers, and I mean the, all the community things that we have a gift to have. And I can't remember if it was the evening before or the morning of the day that she passed away, because that's kind of a blur. But um, I was with her, and of course she was bed confined by that time. And she grabbed me by the arm, this strong hand that had worked on motors and everything else and nearing death and still had great strength in it. And she said, Mother, Mother, don't let me go to sleep. Don't let me go to sleep. Keep me awake. Keep me awake. Don't let me go to sleep. And I'm thinking, what is this? What is this? Of course, our humanity gets in the, play, in the way of us all the time. And she thought that if she went to sleep, she wouldn't see Christ when he came to take her home. She wouldn't see the Blessed Mother when she came to take her home. And I said, oh, sister. I said, you don't have to worry about that. I said, they're not coming for your body. They're coming for your soul. And your soul has been wide awake. Its eyes are open and and flashing with joy, and I promise you, when they come, you will see them, even if your eyes are closed. Oh, I will? I said, yes, you will, you will. She had a very peaceful death. Lots of good, loving people around, and all the gifts that somebody could, that, any of, that I would hope that I will have it that when my time comes. So we're... We just have a little bit more time left, but I wanted to cover the marriage time of Mary and Joseph because that was important. As I told you earlier, St. Joseph had made a vow of chastity. Mary had made one. They didn't know that of each other. But, of course, according to their, tr their Jewish tradition, and remember this came from the line of people who were very faithful to all that God had granted to the Jewish people, and so they followed the law to the letter, but with the right intent and right purposes and right attitude. It wasn't used for something else. And so according to that, the high priest is the one who would choose who this person was to marry. And they and Mary, went, Mary was 14, so it was time that she be betrothed. 
And so according to that custom, the high priest presented her to the eligible bachelors at the time. And Joseph was one of them. Now he was older than she, but he was an eligible bachelor. And so um, Mary, as you can imagine, was very beautiful. I mean, she would be, she was without sin. So this certainly would show all over her. And she had all of these gifts of humility and patience and I mean, the gifts that we would all hope to perfect in our lives at some point. And so these young men were anxious to get chosen for her. So as the mystics tell us, um, when they were all presented before the high priests, they were given a dry branch. And they apparently placed this dry branch before the altar. And when Joseph laid his there, his branch blossomed with a lily-like flower on it. And it was seen, it was readily seen. And so the high priest knew that God had put his mark on this couple. And so Joseph and Mary were betrothed. And, um, and the betrothal took a period of time and then he took her into his home. So his vow of chastity, as I told you, had been since he was 12 years of age and Mary's since she was very young. So they kept that promise to one another. There's a gentleman that I see at one of the parishes where I go all the time. And um, he often talks about St. Joseph. And he just cannot accept the fact that a man, a strong man, carpenter kind of a man, whatever, like Joseph, could ever hold his desires at bay, even for a little period of time. Nope. He said, I don't believe that Joseph was chaste. I just don't believe it. And I told him one day, I said, you know, I hope you meet St. Joseph someday because you obviously have a need that he could help you with, you know? <laughs> you have a need that he could help you with because Joseph was, and God himself entitled him as a just man, and a just man is a good, strong man. He understands God. He has a good relationship with, his, with all that are in his life, and he knows how to be a man, just like Mary knew how to be a woman, a true woman. And in our world today, I don't know about you, but I see so many examples of those who have no idea what manhood and what womanhood really is. And we have to do anything that we can in those that are affiliated with us, people we may have influence, children that we can teach, whatever else, to teach them really what are the qualities of womanhood? What really makes a man? You know, what makes him who he is and what he is? Because these are godlike qualities. And all of us have the capability of attaining them, but sometimes we need help from somebody to help us understand what that really is. So Mary and Joseph were married according to law. Their home was very meager and simple. They had several dwellings before they settled down, as we know, because when Jesus came, when he was ready to come, was when they were called to Bethlehem. And in their daily life, Mary and Joseph read, they discussed holy things together, they discussed the prophecies, they were constantly praying for the coming of the Redeemer, even though at that time, in those early times, Joseph didn't realize what would happen in that regard. And I'm not sure that Mary always understood until the angel came to her, did she understand that she was to be the mother of the Messiah. She just knew that she was praying for that Messiah because that was their call. So when she would talk about things, as, as time evolved, God would let her know things that were going to happen in the future. And the angels helped her to know that. So some of those were held at bay from Joseph and other things she knew ahead of time. And when the angel came, of course, and asked her if she would be the mother of the Savior, 
it's not because she was to be the mother of the Savior. It's because Mary was so humble. Mary was so attuned to God. Mary was so faithful to her faith call, to her prayer life, to asking God whatever it was he wanted she would do, immediately her fiat, immediately. It didn't matter what God was asking her to do. If God was asking, it's okay. It's okay. And it didn't really matter what the future would hold. And we know that as her life opened, as they, as they faced all of these difficulties that came along the way, she still remained faithful. Whatever God asked, she did. She would do, because God asked it. This is something we need to remember in our lives, especially when trials come, when difficulties come, when illness comes, when family breakup comes, when children and grandchildren aren't doing what it is that we know they should be doing. These are the times when we need to call on the Lord and trust, absolutely trust in his might and his power. These are the times when we need to be sure that we are living according to our faith. And according to our faith, it means a sacramental life, regular confession, mass and communion as often as we can, reading holy books, the Bible, all of those things, learning and continually learning about our faith so that when these trials come, we have something to hang on to. See, we're not stuck out in the woods. We have it to hang on to. This is one of the most powerful lessons of the life of Mary and Joseph for us. And Jesus learned from them, even though he was God, he was still man. And many of the things that we would hear him later teaching in his public life, you can see the reflection of the teachings of Mary and Joseph in that life in so many different ways. So um, am I doing that? I hope not. So Joseph would often fret about being so poor, okay? because as we said, um, they had to work. They had to work, but part of their work was always giving to the temple, giving to the poor, and keeping that third for themselves. So oftentimes, he didn't feel like he had what was necessary to provide for his family, especially once he learned that it was to be the Redeemer. He wanted everything for his God. And um, he knew that that Redeemer would come and guide men to the path of eternal life by means of humility and poverty. And the purpose of the Redeemer coming according to humility and poverty was to break the chains of greed and pride in the hearts of men. Was it not pride that caused Adam and Eve to fall in the first place? Was it oftentimes pride that keeps people from finding their real and true relationship with God and what he wants of them? So Mary helped him to understand that they were not meant to be rich in passing goods, and those goods many times are vanity, and when we have so much excess and vanity-forming goods, it darkens the understanding. You see, the less we have bounding upon those things, the lighter and more free we are to see and to understand what it is that God desires of us. Every daily labor, she helped him to understand, was to be a practice of virtue rather than mere manual work. You would do manual work. Joseph was a manual worker. We know that. But that labor was not meant to be laborious only. It was meant to be a practice of virtue. So if you are a carpenter, you do your carpentry work, and you do it the best you can, absolutely the best you can. And many times when um, their, their, um, their true value of humility was served in that, and that they were called to serve people, not to be served. 
And, and that's part of humility. And they, they understood that possessions weigh men down and prevent them from understanding all that God wished them to know. You have so many possessions, you have to spend an awful lot of time taking care of them. And it takes you away from what God wishes you to know. So Mary and Joseph performed work for others, and yet they never demanded wages or set a price on their labor. Okay? They worked not for gain, but for charity, or to supply a need, and what they would do is that they would leave the payment up to whoever it was that they were working for, what they felt was a just wage. So this became a perfect degree of sanctity in economic matters. Oftentimes we don't think about that. How can I be holy in economic matters? When the edict was announced requiring Joseph to register in his town, they learned not to be concerned for all that would happen, even though Mary was pregnant, because this was ordained by the Lord. They could be at peace about that, the fact that it was ordained by the Lord because they were doing everything they should be doing to make it right. You can always make a judgment like that for yourselves when, when you wonder if what you're doing is, is what you should be doing. I don't know about you, but part of our problem in life is that we have so many things to be done, so many things to do all the time, so many things on our plate, so many things that have to be addressed. How do we know what the right one is? And you know, the one below is tempting people who are good by putting good things in place of whatever it is that God wants them to do. Do you know what I mean by that? Many times you know you've, okay, I have these seven things that could be done today, and then in comes something else. Oh, gee, I better not do these seven. I'll let that go till later today, and I'll go do this when really God wanted us to do those seven things. We have to pray continually for that guidance of grace and of the Lord. So, um, Joseph was sure when they went to Bethlehem that there would be relatives there to give them a place to stay. He didn't have any question about that. That's where his family was. That's where their friends were. That's where he grew up. So he had no concern about that. Now Mary already knew that there would be issues with that, but Joseph didn't. So um, he took them on the trip. It took them that long length of time to get there. And she understood ahead because the angels had informed her or God had informed her of some of the things that would occur, but she always held those within her heart. She would never place a burden upon Joseph that she could have held herself. That's being a real woman. You know, how do I judge what things I lay upon the ones that I love? Do I carry them for myself or do I always have to let it all out so that somebody else has to carry my weight for me? So he was told when the time was right in the eyes of God that the Redeemer was coming and that it would be born according to, the, according to the prophets, that the Redeemer would be born in Bethlehem. And again, all along the way, Mary would ask God to forgive her weaknesses and to help her complete what God had desired for her and for her spouse, constantly asking God to forgive those weaknesses. So the Constitution in the Church tells us this. We're urged by Vatican II Fathers to continue traditional devotion and recourse to Mary. And it said, let the entire body of the faithful pour forth persevering prayer to the Mother of God and the Mother of Men. Let them implore that she who aided the beginnings of the Church by her prayers may now, 
exalted as she is in heaven above all the angels and saints, intercede with her soul. Veneration of Mary is essentially linked with that of Christ, deriving from it and leading to it. That was Pope Paul VI. And the catechism, Catholic catechism, tells us that in giving birth, you kept your virginity. In your dormition, you did not leave the world. We know the end of Mary's life was a dormition. But you were joined to the source of life. You conceived the living God, and by your prayers will deliver our souls from death. Mary is our mother in the order of grace. Mary is the image and beginning of the church as it is to be perfected in the world to come. Likewise, she shines forth on earth until the day of the Lord shall come, a sign of certain hope and comfort to the pilgrim people. And the Pope once told us that the greatest treasure that was in the Vatican of all the treasures that are there is the rosary. That's our greatest treasure. So Mary offered herself as an empty vessel. She did not try to live according to human calculation, but put herself completely at the disposal of God's mysterious and incomprehensible design. She wanted to be the instrument and servant of the Lord, and therein lies her true fame. It's not about the appearances she's had. It's not about the miracles she has done. Her true fame is in being the instrument and servant of the Lord. And she believed against all odds what God had wanted would come to be. We know the rest of the story. I don't need to tell you all those things and their faithfulness and whatever. But um, we ask her, and, and she is the queen of heaven, invites all women to share in her queenly qualities, and she shows men how to honor and cherish and respect those qualities in the lives of their loved ones. Mary shows us that. And it comes through her own virtues of piety and obedience and acceptance of suffering. What Christ suffered, Mary suffered. When Christ was in pain, she was in pain because she was our co-redemptrix. And all of that leads to a life of peace and happiness and love. So while her life was laborious, her holiness was persistent. And we ourselves can find every opportunity to follow in the example of Mary, St. Joseph, and her son. So on the papers that you have, <clears throat> would you kindly look at the Magnificat? Did we say that? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, then, a prayer to Mary's Immaculate Heart. I apologize. <clears throat> Mary, I ask your dear loving heart, my mother, for special graces which God gives through you from the sacred heart of Jesus. I ask for graces not only for myself, but for the entire world. Together with you, O Immaculate Heart, I offer you, my Heavenly Father, the sacred body and precious blood of Jesus present in all the tabernacles of the world. I am all yours, and all that I have is yours, my heart, my eyes, my hands, my feet. I give you my thoughts, my mind, my will, and all things that are mine to use in service of Jesus and his chosen people. I ask this in the loving name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And before I finally close, because I wanted to cover so much more, but our time is up. Do you have any questions? Yes. Have you ever read a book called The Blessed Virgin Mary and the Kingdom of the Divine Will? 
No, I have not read a book called The Blessed Virgin Mary and the Kingdom of, God, of the Divine Will. A 31 day meditation book. That's good. Yeah. And the name again is? It's called The Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. For those that are listening, The Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. Thank you. I'll have to get that. The author is Louisa Picaretta. Picaretta. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. The ones that I used were um, St. Elizabeth of Sweden. Um, um, I have them written down, just a minute. Where did I put them? Anna of Agrita was one, and St. Um, Elizabeth of, her last name I can't pronounce, but it was like Lao, but she was a, one of our mystics. Mm -hmm. So Mary reminds us that um, let the past curtail your present journey. Don't be afraid of the future. Be a doer, not a worrier. Be as God-centered as possible in all circumstances and reject anything that is not of the will of God. She prayed, she dressed and acted with chastity. She cared for her home, the family and the poor and was centered on her vocational call. We have her as an example for vocations for married life as well as for religious life. And remember that your vocation that is given to you is that call that will take you to heaven. That's what your vocation is. And once you learn and realize what it is, let nothing stand in the way of following what that vocation is, whatever it may be, you can always, all of us can always work to make our religious life more holy, to wake, make our family lives more holy, to build up the relationship that we have as spouses one with the other. That's our gift, and the grace continues to move with us. When God gives us that call, he gives us the grace to complete it, and completing it is the end of our life. Not just, you know, well, we're married now and that's it. No, that's just the very, very beginning. Our job is to get each other to heaven. Each other to heaven. However, whatever that takes, whatever sacrifices. And if we remember that we're trying to get each other as well as ourselves to heaven, then the efforts won't be burdensome. They will be light. They will be uplifting. They will be energizing. That's what Mary's vocation was for her. So I'm going to close with this prayer. It's called the lovely lady of every day. You don't have it. O lady of every day, dear mother, who kept a house for Jesus and Joseph, who swept the floors and baked the bread that Jesus ate, who cooked and washed and carried water from the well. O oh, laboring lady of every day, help me to work my best today and every day. Give me strength. Give me patience. Give me endurance. Give me love to make my labor light. O oh, lady of every day, who loved the good and pitied the bad, who smiled on every neighbor and spoke a cheerful word to every passerby, who nursed the sick and fed the hungry. O loving lady of every day, make me gentle and cheerful and helpful that I may make my loved one's labor light. O lady of every day, who morning, noon, and night, and over every meal found time to pray, who read the Holy Scriptures, who meditated daily on the things of God, who saw, 
foresaw and faced with joy the cross that was to come and knew that he who bore his own would bear her crosses too. O sorrowful lady of every day, queen of days to come, lead me gently to my Savior. Let me hold his loving hand. Let him make my journey safe, my burden light, my cross a crown. Sorrowful lady of every day, make me like unto you. Make me brave, make me strong and holy every day. O lovely lady, laboring lady, lady of every day. Amen. So can we close with Hail Mary, gentle woman? She's been over here waiting. Blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of death. Amen. Gentle woman, quiet light, morning star, so strong, so bright. Gentle mother, peaceful dove, teach us wisdom. Teach us love. You were chosen by the Father. You were chosen by the Son. You were chosen from all women and for strong and bright, gentle mother, peaceful dove, teach us wisdom, teach us love, blessed are you among women, blessed in Page four, let's close with the litany to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Why don't you stand for this? 
We'll say it together. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Ghost, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Holy Mother of God, pray for us. Holy Virgin of Virgins, pray for us. Mother of Christ, pray for us. Mother of Divine Grace, pray for us. Mother Most Pure, pray for us. Mother Most Chaste, pray for us. Mother Inviolate, pray for us. Mother Undefiled, pray for us. Mother Most Amiable, pray for us. Mother Most Admirable, pray for us. Mother of Good Counsel, pray for us. Mother of our Redeemer, pray for us. Mother of our Savior, pray for us. Virgin Most Prudent, pray for us. Virgin Most Venerable, pray for us. Virgin Most Renowned, pray for us. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us. Virgin Most Merciful, pray for us. Virgin Most Faithful, pray for us. Mirror of Justice, pray for us. Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Cause of our joy, pray for us. Spiritual Vessel, pray for us. Vessel of Honor, pray for us. Singular Vessel of Devotion, pray for us. Mystical Rose, pray for us. Tower of David, pray for us. Tower of Ivory, pray for us. House of Gold, pray for us. Ark of the Covenant, pray for us. Gate of Heaven, pray for us. Morning Star, pray for us. Health of the Sick, pray for us. Refuge of Sinners, pray for us. Comforter of the Afflicted, pray for us. Help of Christians, pray for us. Queen of Angels, pray for us. Queen of Patriarchs, pray for us. Prophets, pray for us. Queen of Apostles, pray for us. Queen of Martyrs, pray for us. Queen of Confessors, pray for us. Queen of Virgins, pray for us. Queen of All Saints, pray for us. Queen Conceived Without Original Sin, pray for us. Queen Assumed Into Heaven, pray for us. Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, pray for us. Queen of Peace, pray for us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Grant we beseech thee, O Lord God, that we thy servants may enjoy perpetual health of mind and body, and by the glorious intercession of the Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, be delivered from present sorrow and enjoy eternal happiness through Christ our Lord, amen. I am a firm believer that you become what you surround yourself with. I wanted you to have some inspiration of Our Lady and somehow a greater appreciation and understanding of her tonight. So I brought her to surround you. And the relic that's up here is a relic of St. Anne, and the other is a relic of the House of Our Lady. So um, Mary has come in several ways to grant you her blessing. May she walk with you and bless you this night. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being such a good audience. And you stayed awake too. Did you say Mother of God? I mean, Mother of